Wow, thank you so much. I've had such a long day that makes me feel energized. So welcome. I'm happy to see such a full house for our very special guest this evening. This year we are celebrating the 175th anniversary of the founding of our institution. We have a theme for this festivity, celebrating the past, forging the future, St. Mary's College of Maryland, 175 years proud. Since 1840, St. Mary's College has been the state's living memorial to the first practice of freedom of conscience in America. When this institution's doors opened in 1846, and I know some of you have really said on the side, you think I ain't that old. <laughs> In 1846, there were three faculty, a male principal, and 10 female boarding students, all white, all from Southern Maryland, all well-to-do. Today, we are a four-year public honors college led by a woman who looks like me. We have 1,720 undergraduate students from 15 states and six countries and over 140 faculty. Our student body spans the socioeconomic spectrum. It's 60% female, 27% underrepresented minority. Times have changed and they have changed for the better. We have evolved from being a finishing school <laughs> to one of the best institutions of higher education in the nation, as evidenced by our rankings in US News and World Report, Princeton Review, Kiplinger's, and on and on. We embody that living memorial to freedom of conscience in the St. Mary's way, respect for self, respect for others, respect for the environment. When we fail to embody our ethos, we fail not only those who come, came before us, but we fail ourselves and those who look to us to forge the future. Last year, I initiated a campus work group for inclusivity, diversity, equity, and safety. This year, our programming for our 175th celebration includes thought leaders in these arenas like our guests this evening. Tim Wise, I am certain this will be a thought-provoking event that will lead us to a greater good. So without further delay, I now ask that you welcome Vera Demenka, a member of St. Mary's class of 2016, who will introduce Tim Wise. So I had the privilege of first being exposed to the sheer wisdom, superior intellect, and blunt force that is Tim Wise through his Facebook page. And my first thought was, I've never heard a white man who is such an advocate for black people. Well, actually, it was more like, no, he sounds like a vanilla brother. <laughs> <laughs> but I was pleased to find that other scholars have referred to Mr. Wise as a vanilla brother, so I'm not the only person who thinks so. He's the very epitome of the word ally, and I'm convinced you'll understand why by the end of tonight's talk. He's frequently described as an anti-racist activist, but I don't believe that that term truly embodies all that he is. He's an activist, an advocate, a speaker, teacher, author, and friend to minorities of all colors, classes, and backgrounds. He spent his career speaking at more than a thousand colleges and universities, high schools and professional and academic conferences. He's trained professionals in law enforcement, the medical field and other sectors with the goal and intention of helping institutions identify, treat and dismantle racial inequalities within their walls. 
I kind of like to think of him as an exterminator for the lingering pests of racism that exist in institutions, the acts of police brutality, the economic disparities between races, and just many other facets that comprise the racial tensions and inequities in our nation. So who exactly is he? He's a native of Nashville, Tennessee, and he was exposed to the malevolence of white supremacy in his early childhood. His activism began at his college days at Tulane University, where he helped lead his campus's anti-apartheid movement. And after graduating with a degree in political science, he dove into social justice activism as a full-time career. This started out as serving as a youth coordinator, and soon after he served as coordinator and associate director of the Louisiana Coalition Against Racism and Nazism, organizing in the early 1990s to defeat the political candidacies of white supremacists and former Ku Klux Klan leader David Duke. So he had his act together right after college. <laughs> I hope I can be like that someday. From there, he became a community organizer in New Orleans public housing and a policy analyst for children's advocacy groups focusing on combating poverty. He served as an adjunct professor at the Smith College School of Social Work and as an advisor to the Fisk University Race Relations Institute. So I personally believe that the best way to learn about somebody is through their own words. And um, I know that some people might feel that it makes no sense to have a white man speaking about issues of race when he himself is in a position of privilege or race is concerned. So in his own words, when describing the use of his white privilege to provide education and initiate action towards racial equality, Mr. Wise says, it makes no sense to think that if I receive privilege, I must therefore be a hypocrite for also criticizing the privileges and the system that bestows them. By that logic, members of the dominant group should never speak out on behalf of equity. So it's definitely clear that he sees his position in the dominant group not as a means to turn a colorblind eye to race, but to open the eyes of others who may be more receptive to hearing him speak. So Mr. Wise is the amazing author of six books, including his highly acclaimed memoir, White Like Me, Reflections from a Privileged Son, Dear White America, Letter to a New Minority, under and under the affluence, shaming the poor, praising the rich, and sacrificing the future of America. And some of his books will be available later on tonight, so I'm sure you hear a bit about that. His essays have appeared on Alternet, Salon, Huffington Post, The Root, Black Commentator, and many other platforms. He's regularly on CNN and MSNBC to discuss race issues and has been featured on ABC's 2020. He's also been featured in several documentaries, including Vocabulary of Change, which features him in dialogue with legendary scholar and activist Angela Davis. The two examine connections between race, class, gender, sexuality, and militarism, and explore intergenerational movement and the prospects for social change. So Vocabulary of Change is actually going to be shown on this campus in the coming months, so pay attention to the all student emails. But I guess all of this is just to express what a gem and a treasure we have in Mr. Tim Wise. He's an exceedingly intelligent man who has devoted his life to a noble cause, and I can tell you he's a treat to listen to. I'm so excited to have him here. And without further ado, it's my privilege to welcome Mr. Tim Wise to the stage as he presents his talk, Resurrecting the Park. That was way too nice. And the fact that you had all that nice stuff to say even after you first discovered me on my Facebook page is especially shocking because that's not always the best place to discover me, to be honest. I'm not always at my best on uh, social media, so glad you still feel good about it. Yeah, yeah, you know. But I mean, none of us are, right? That's really not, that's not our best platform sometimes to uh, express complex thought. But, uh, you know, it'll do in a pinch, right? 400 characters or so. And, 140 on Twitter, so I suppose, you know, we do what we can. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate this. I'm quite certain we're breaking some fire codes, but um, having just driven in from Baltimore, I'm not sure where the fire marshal is in relation to here, but I'm guessing it would take, uh, you know, whoever that person is longer to get here than it'll take me to finish speaking. So even if we're uh, breaking the rules, probably be all right, you know, head for the exits. Um, 
in any event, thank you all so much, those who made this possible. Um, it is really good to be here. I'm spending the better part of this week in the greater Baltimore area, and uh, I'm glad to be able to come out this way. It's a lovely campus. It's a really nice night. The weather is good, and this is a really fantastic crowd. So I hope that uh, all of that amazing uh, set of accolades that was just said about me is something to which I can live up this evening. I make no promises, but I will do what I can. And I'll start off the way I did last night. I was at Towson, just outside of Baltimore, and the night before I was at Stevenson, also just outside of Baltimore. And I was... Uh, started off those speeches very much the way I will this evening because it struck me, I was, I was in town, I don't know Baltimore very well, but I was driving around and I was headed out to the event in Stevenson a couple evenings ago and, uh, and as I went down the street to get to the interstate, I passed by in downtown Baltimore near the Inner Harbor, I uh, looked over to my right at a stoplight and I noticed something that had a big sort of stone sign out front and it had some other engravings in the walls uh, on the corner, and it said Holocaust Memorial. And I got to thinking on the one hand, you know, first of all, I intuited from this. I didn't get out and walk around and actually find out what it was. I haven't Googled it since, but I'm fairly confident, based just on what I know about this country and what I know it normally means when we say we have a Holocaust Memorial, that we are in all likelihood speaking of the Holocaust of European Jewry specifically. I don't know that, but I'm guessing that's probably the case. And Look, as someone who's a Jew, I get it. That is extremely important. We need to remember the tragedies of the past, and that would certainly be one of the greater tragedies of human history. So on the one hand, I got to thinking as I was driving, having passed the Holocaust Memorial, that it is certainly worthwhile and, in fact, critical to memorialize and remember the past, and not only the warm and the fuzzy and the happy elements of it, but the tragedies as well. And yet it also struck me as I continued to drive, and I gave some thought to this Holocaust Memorial in the middle of downtown Baltimore in the United States of America. It struck me how much easier it is apparently, and it is not only in downtown Baltimore in the state of Maryland in the United States of America, but in town after town, city after city, state after state all around this country, how much easier it is apparently for us to memorialize, commemorate, and recall the horrors and the crimes of other countries and other peoples rather than our own, I would suggest to you that we are far quicker indeed to memorialize the Holocaust of European Jewry, which again, I am not suggesting is a bad idea, I get it, but we are quicker to do that than we are to memorialize the 93 million souls extinguished from this continent in the name of conquest by European peoples, that is to say, our indigenous brothers and sisters. We have more memorials to the European dead during Hitlerism's reign than we have to those 93 million souls. We have very few memorials and commemorations to those who died in the Middle Passage and afterward the Ma'afa, as Marimba Ani calls it, a Swahili word for great catastrophe. We do not memorialize them as much. And indeed, we have more memorials in this country and I dare say in this state to the Confederacy and those who died to defend it than we have to those who were oppressed by it. More memorials to the Confederate war dead who, and make no mistake about this, and I say this as a Southerner whose people have been on this land in this part of the United States since the early 1600s and fought for the Confederacy, that is to say on the wrong side of justice, that when those soldiers fell, they fell in the service of white supremacy. That is not me, by the way, saying that. That is the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, saying that he who said that the cornerstone of that government was white supremacy. So we are having an easier time memorializing those who fought and died to maintain human bondage and a system of white superiority than we are willing to memorialize those who died because of the system of white superiority. Why am I telling you this? One, because it's fun. <laughs> to tell you this, because I enjoy the discomfort that is caused by speaking truth. That's just me, though. That's just me, and that's selfish. And if that's the only reason I was doing it, that wouldn't be right. There's a better reason. <laughs> the real reason I'm telling you this is because when we remember certain things and not others, when we recall certain things and not others, what we remember and what we recall matters and what we forget matters as well. Or maybe not just what we forget, what we never learned. Right? 
And if you don't understand your past, I don't mean another country's past. I don't mean another nation's past, another people's past. I mean your own. When you do not know the past of what has happened, transpired, and existed on this soil, then it is very difficult to understand the present. You can't really understand what happens now with regard to these issues of race, racial inequality, and injustice if you don't have a clear-headed view of what has gone before. If you don't understand the predicate to something, it becomes very difficult to understand where you are and where you're headed. And that is true of so many things in our present day. You cannot, for instance, understand the uprising in Baltimore this summer if you try to understand it in a vacuum, which is what most in the media would like to do, most politicians would like to do, most of those who cannot understand the apparent irrationality of inner city black Baltimoreans rising up and engaging in what they would like to call a riot, one may call it a rebellion, an uprising, whatever term you choose, you still need to understand the context behind it. Because there's something else we don't memorialize in Baltimore, even as we memorialize the Holocaust of European Jewry. We do not memorialize the damage, the violence, the systemic and institutional damage done to the black community in that town by things like urban renewal and highway construction that beginning in the 1950s, extending all the way to the early 1970s, knocked down black houses, black-owned businesses as they plowed the interstate through the heart of the black community. They did that in every major city in this country. Two-thirds of all black housing in America in urban areas knocked to the ground to make way for economic progress from which black people could not benefit. Two out of three homes lived in by black folks, hundreds of thousands of single resident occupancy dwellings knocked down to make way for the interstate, to make way for office buildings, to make way for shopping malls, to make way for parking lots. But then folks sit back and wonder why black folks all crowded up, huddled up in the so-called hood. Like that was an accident. See, the ghetto, as we called it, was not created by those who live in the so-called ghetto. It was created by people who most certainly do not, did not, couldn't find the ghetto on a map with an app. <laughs> and they created it. And they created it as a holding pen for people they did not want to live around them in the leafy suburbs to which only they as white folks could move. This is not, by the way, my version of history. This is incontestable, inarguable folks who said to black and brown peoples in the cities, number one, we will knock down your joint and we will knock down your businesses and we will force you thereby to move into public housing and crowded homes. By the way, lead paint infested homes in the city of Baltimore that poisoned thousands of families thereby contributing to lead levels in the blood three to four times what is considered safe by the CDC, killing brain cells of small children, and we didn't care enough as a nation to actually do something about it until the damage had already been done. Finally, some of those slumlords got sued, but by then, thousands of families had been poisoned. One family in particular, whose son, name you may have heard of, Freddie Gray, poisoned before the cops got a hold of him in Baltimore. See, this country, we killed Freddie Gray twice. Number one, when he was growing up in a lead-infested home with a slumlord who apparently didn't commit a crime because that slumlord didn't have to actually go to jail. So you can kill a poor black man in America, and if you do it with lead paint, the worst thing that's going to happen is you get sued and fork over some money. If Freddie Gray had killed his slumlord, I dare say, he would be sitting on death row or in a penitentiary for the rest of his life. That's the difference between systemic violence, institutional violence, and retail stuff that happens on the street. Retail versus wholesale, you see. But we focus on the retail because that's so much easier. You throw a brick through a CVS in downtown Baltimore in the black community and burn it to the ground, we call that violence. You poison thousands of black folks in the city of Baltimore with the approval, in some cases, of Johns Hopkins University, because that is the other thing we don't memorialize, and nobody even hears about it. What in the world is this crazy man talking about? I'm going to tell you. In the 1990s, Johns Hopkins University decided to do a study for which they needed guinea pigs. Now, who are you going to get to be your guinea pig in the United States of America, even as late as the 1990s? What did they do? They wanted to find out the different effects of lead abatement programs on lead levels in children's blood. Everybody knew that poor black folk had been poisoned in the city of Baltimore by slumlords, but they didn't really know what types of abatement would work best. And so there were three different levels of lead abatement that 
this study involved. One was like a really serious level of lead abatement where you really went in there and you got the lead out. Another one was sort of a middle level and another was barely any treatment at all. And they decided they wanted to put families into these apartments and then over time test the lead levels in the blood to see which one works better. As if you somehow need proof that the one where you get rid of all the lead works better. Like that is obvious, isn't it? Why do you need to study that? Why, in fact, why don't you just knock the lead infested houses down and build new houses for people? Why? Because that would be too expensive. It's a lot cheaper to just throw them in there. They bribed families. They paid them $5, $50, gave them free t-shirts to have these families move into these lead infested homes. Well, what do you know? In the case of the folks who were in the apartments that were seriously decontaminated, they did pretty good. Their lead levels actually dropped. So that's fantastic. But if you were one of the children that got placed in the medium or the low level lead abatement, your lead levels went up. In other words, they used poor black folks to prove a point. They used poor black folks in the name of science to tell them something that anyone with any common sense would already have known. Lead is not good for children. You didn't have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars or whatever it cost to come to that conclusion. That was obvious. It was apparent. But those lives are not as valuable. See, that's wholesale violence. Burn a CBS, it makes the news. Poison black children for year after year after year, sometimes in the name of science with funding from the government, and it is not called violence. So we don't memorialize that. We don't even know about it. We don't learn about it. You can grow up in Baltimore. You can certainly grow up in the suburbs of Baltimore and not know anything about it. Right? You can grow up all over this country and not know because we don't really know the predicate to the stuff that's going on now. And if you don't understand that history, then you can't understand the uprising. It seems irrational. Because all we're thinking about is, well, everything was fine, and then all of a sudden these folks lost their minds. Right? But everything was not fine, and you could only believe that if you knew nothing about the history of Baltimore. So we have to be very clear and understand that which came before, that which we observe now, if we hope to really understand that which we observe now. The problem is, in this country, we're not very good at that. And particularly those in the dominant group are not very good at that. I don't mean that as a critique of the dominant group as human beings or as individuals or as people. I mean it in the same sense that James Baldwin meant it when he said the following. This was a half a century ago, actually a little more than that. Baldwin said, people who imagine that history flatters them, as it does indeed since they wrote it, are impaled on their history like a butterfly on a pin and they become incapable of seeing themselves or changing themselves or the world. This, it appears to me, Baldwin continued, is where it seems most white Americans find themselves. They are dimly or vividly aware that the history they have fed themselves is mostly a lie, but they cannot be released from it, and they suffer enormously from the resulting personal incoherence. What did Baldwin mean? He meant that people who have lied to themselves and others for so long about their history can't even see the truth anymore, can't see themselves embedded in that history, and then can't be released from it to a place that might lead us down the road to justice. Baldwin said that with great sympathy for white Americans. That wasn't a harsh judgment. That was sympathetic. That was empathic. That was actually a cry for help on behalf of white folks to actually get released from the history, the lies that we've told ourselves because when we don't understand those lies we find ourselves impaled he was suggesting to us that the key to our future was a true honest reflection and honest interrogation of that past but we as a people again not particularly good at that in spite of the fact that having an understanding of that past is so critical if we're going to be able to move forward it's not just with regard to the uprising in Baltimore, but it is with regard to the larger issue of black lives in this country and their relationship to the criminal justice system. It is important with regard to a true level-headed understanding of the issue of immigration. It is important to an understanding of how we're going to move forward and create a multiracial, multicultural democracy within the next 30 years, by which time, if we have not, we'll be in real trouble because 30 years from now, as you may or may not know, Half the population of this country are going to be folks of color and half are going to be white. That's just a fact. And it doesn't matter what you think about it. It doesn't matter what Donald Trump thinks about it. <laughs> I know he's going to build a wall. He's going to build a wall like you wouldn't believe 
a wall like you wouldn't believe. Everything is like you wouldn't believe with this guy. What is a wall that I wouldn't believe? At? A wall that I wouldn't believe would be a wall made of butter. Is that what he's suggesting? Like, because I don't believe that. Like, I don't believe you can build a wall out of butter. That's like the only kind I don't believe. And then, so who builds walls better than Trump? I don't know. Everybody? Trump's never built a wall. Trump builds casinos and hotels and office buildings. Whoever said he can? Trump doesn't even build that. Usually, undocumented or recently documented immigrants are the ones who build his stuff. So, I mean, the irony here is beautiful, and we'll come back to that, because that too is fun, but. But again, you can't have this conversation about immigration. You can't have a conversation about police misconduct and the relationship and the relations between law enforcement and people of color in this country if you don't know the history. If you don't interrogate the history, things like the phrase Black Lives Matter seem offensive to you. Black Lives Matter, oh, oh, what? All lives matter. <laughs> yes, sweetheart, we get that. We get that. We get that, okay? Right, they do. That's absolutely true. Just like back in 1970 when folks were saying black is beautiful to reclaim a beauty standard that had been only and always for white people, it was true that white people were pretty too and beautiful too and all of us are beautiful in our own way. Sort of not the point. In 1970, it was important to proclaim that which was denigrated. It was important to hold up that which was ignored. And if it was black beauty that was being ignored, then by God, it was important to proclaim that black was beautiful. And if it is black lives that are not considered to matter, then by God, it is important that we proclaim that now without fear, without trepidation, and without being lectured that somehow that's racist. <laughs> to respond to Black Lives Matter with all lives matters, like, like in the 80s when the HIV AIDS crisis hit and ACT UP was out in the streets demanding funding, right, to try to find a cure. And in effect, what they were saying was people with AIDS lives matter. Because at that time, President Reagan had even uttered the word for three years after the crisis broke, only said something about it after his buddy Rock Hudson died of the disease, right? So ACT UP was out there saying people with AIDS lives matter. And to say all lives matter in response to Black Lives Matter would be like rushing into the middle of an ACT UP rally in 1985 and saying, well, wait a minute, what about pancreatic cancer? People die of that too. Yes, precious, we know. <laughs> It'd be like going into a cancer ward at Children's Hospital and then lecturing people about sudden infant death syndrome. Yes, we understand people die of other things. Totally not the point. To say all lives matter or white lives matter, like that needs to be reminded in the cold. Just like the people who say, why don't we have white history month? I don't know, you have May, you have June, you have July, you have August. I mean, you know, it just, but again, if you don't know the history of the way in which black life has been denigrated and considered not valuable, then I guess it does seem shocking. It does seem odd to proclaim that black lives matter. And in theory, you shouldn't have to do it. It should be taken for granted, but it isn't, and thus we must, right? By the same token, you can't understand the way in which many black folks and Certainly those low-income, moderate-income, working-class black folks often feel about law enforcement. It just seems irrational, right? It seems hateful. And now you have all these propagandists running around saying that Black Lives Matter as a movement is a police assassination squad. They say this in spite of the following. Number one, no one affiliated with Black Lives Matter has ever killed a cop, tried to kill a cop, or even assaulted a cop. Number two, the actual rate at which police are being killed on the job in this country is at a 25-year low. There is not an increase in deaths of such officers. There has been a decrease, even though the killing of unarmed people by law enforcement is at a 40-year high. So if there is a trend in this country, it is not black and brown folk or white folk, for that matter, captain officers. It is quite the opposite of that. Let us be clear. Data matters. Facts matter. You're entitled to your opinion. You're not entitled to your own phony statistics. And those statistics are very, very clear, but the value of trying to delegitimize Black Lives Matter as a movement is too important to some people to look at facts. And so they want to turn it into this anti-police thing, which is fascinating because, again, to not understand how black and brown folks see law enforcement is to not know history. See, to white folks, it makes no sense. Right? It's like back during the O.J. Simpson trial. And by that, I mean the first one. I know there have been a couple. I mean the first O.J. Simpson trial. First O.J. Simpson trial where he's acquitted of murder, right? Now, 
I'm not speaking to whether he was guilty or innocent. It, it, you know, it's a 20 year thing now. It's really, he's in prison for some other stuff. So whatever it is, he's, he's locked up. He's not getting out, right? But, um, so here's the thing though. Back then, if you recall, and some of y'all will be too young to remember this firsthand, but if you've heard about it, you know that the reason he was acquitted was because during the presentation of the state's case, it came to light that the lead detective who was responsible for finding most of the blood evidence in the case had a long history of racist misconduct. And the jury, which was not all black by any stretch, but uh, had a large number of African-Americans on it and some white folks who also heard that and sort of went, Whoa. you know? <laughs> because to be black in this country, for sure, if you hear that there's a cop who has a history of racism, who found the blood evidence to, in, uh, to inculpate a black guy who's accused of killing two white people, you can forgive black folks for thinking, hmm, alarm bells, something might be wrong here. It doesn't mean that OJ didn't do it. And I talked to an awful lot of black folk after the trial that were like, yeah, I don't think he did it. But <laughs> you know, he did it, you know. Don't get me wrong, he did it. But, but, but they still believed that the possibility that evidence had been planted was real enough to create the prospect of reasonable doubt. Now, I'm not here to adjudicate that. It's not relevant. It's not really all that important what I think about it or what you think about it. But what I'm trying to say is that the reaction of black America versus white America was about this history and our, uh, and our inability to see the differences in that history between white and black folks. So to black folks, the prospect of evidence being planted and people being framed by law enforcement is real. It's not paranoia, right? It's history. And black folks knew that, not only in Los Angeles, but all around the country. That's been the history of how law enforcement had operated far too often in black communities. But to white folks, we heard that and we're like, well, that's just silly. Planting evidence. Who's ever heard of such a thing? Well, police are the ones that, you know, get your cat out of the tree and, <laughs> and give you a ride around in their car just for funsies. But for people of color, that isn't real. And we thought they were being irrational, but come to find out three years later what happens. The Rampart scandal in Los Angeles breaks. What was the Rampart scandal? It was a scandal in which several cops, about a half a dozen as I recall, were actually caught doing exactly what that jury thought they might have done to O.J. Simpson, which was planting evidence on criminal suspects either to frame them outright or to sweeten the cases against them when they indeed had done some particular crime. So in fact, black folks weren't seeing things. They weren't being irrational. They were listening to the history and to the current reality of what their experience was in that city. If you don't know that, if you don't understand that to black folks, when black folks look at police, right, they don't see the same thing because they don't experience the same. Police were the ones that enforced the black codes. Police were the ones that pulled civil rights protesters off the stools in the South and beat them senseless in the street. Police were the ones who were engaged in the lynching of thousands of black folks. Even if they didn't do it, they let the black folks who were in the jail out into the mob. So they were implicated in the lynching of thousands of people, sometimes stood by and watched it happen. Black folks know that and they remember that and that memory means something. Right? Black, black folks know that it was police who were implicated in the killing of 27 members of the Black Panther Party in the late 1960s and the early 1970s with the help of the FBI. Right? They know that it was police that were involved in some of the most vicious race riots against black communities. 1919, East St. Louis, Illinois, one of the biggest pogroms against black folks on this continent. 139 people killed in just a day and a half to two days, including 35 children thrown into bonfires in the street. And police were heavily implicated in it right there in the midst of it all, encouraging the white mob to kill these folk because they had moved north, if you consider East St. Louis north. It's pretty south but moved north from you know, the deep south to look for industrial jobs in the early part of the 20th century. So if you have that history and that historic relationship to law enforcement, it makes sense that you're going to view it a little differently. It doesn't mean that that view is always going to be accurate, right? And it doesn't mean that every officer is one of those guys that would have been involved in the riots or the pogroms or the lynchings or the enforcement of the black coats or pulling protesters off the stools, but it does mean that the uniform, the badge, the gun means something different to some as opposed to others. And to not understand the fundamental rationality of that is to act as if history did not happen or that perhaps it did happen, but it doesn't matter, which is sort of what we like to think in this country. Actually, we love history when it makes us feel good. We love it. We love the past, right? That's why I always find it fascinating when white folks tell black folks like, you need to get over slavery, that was a thousand years ago. 
You know, it's funny, like we used to say, like we used to know how long ago slavery was, it was like 150, right? But now it's like we keep moving it back. So now it's like 300, it's 711 years ago. That was like before Jesus. That was so long ago that who could even remember it? Right? Even though there are people alive today whose great grandparents could have indeed been owned as children, certainly great great grandparents could have been. So it's really not that long, but it's funny, isn't it, that we say, you need to get over that, get over enslavement, get over segregation, get over the indigenous genocide, get over the theft of half of Mexico and a war of aggression that this country started. Oh, yeah, we'll come back to that, too. <laughs> get over all that. That was a long time ago. That's really funny, because, like, on July 4th, we're going to be setting off fireworks with some really old stuff as well, right? And nobody seems to mind. July 4th, Independence Day, like, we didn't break away from the British last Wednesday. That is some old stuff. <laughs> But we still celebrate it. Apple pie, fireworks, red, white, and blue clothing, because that's a good wardrobe palette. We do that every year. <laughs> Big I heart the USA buttons on our hat, talking about the past. We love the past as long as it makes us feel good. We used to say things like, remember the Alamo. Why? That's a long time ago. Let's just forget it. Remember Pearl Harbor. Why, old man? That was a long time ago, right? I told my grandfather that. He probably would too happy about it, right? So we remember the past when it elevates us, when it venerates us, when it makes us feel like we're the greatest nation ever struck off by the hand of God Almighty. But God forbid we're asked to remember the past and how it brought us to the present in a way that isn't so pretty and isn't so nice and isn't so shiny and loving. But you can't understand the rebellion in Baltimore and the larger struggle against criminal injustice system if you don't understand that past. The rebellion against police misconduct isn't just about Freddie Gray, and it's not just about Tamir Rice, and it's not just about John Crawford and Eric Garner and all of that, though it is about that. It's not just about Sandra Bland, who died in police custody for reasons that we may never really know. It's not just about that. It's also about the day-to-day -day stuff that happens. Because on the good side of things, the good news is that you know, most of the time, police don't kill folks, just like most of the time, folks don't kill police. That's the good news, right? Good news is, even though the killing of unarmed folks is at a 40-year high by law enforcement, it still is relatively speaking rare. But you know what isn't rare? The war on drugs. That's what isn't rare. And that is another way at the lower level at which black and brown folks are continually oppressed in this country by the so-called criminal justice system. Here's how I know that. First of all, let's be clear. The war on drugs is not about drugs. If you learn nothing else this evening, you can write that down. The war on drugs has nothing whatsoever to do with drugs. <laughs> And although I'm going to give you some numbers in a second that will prove it beyond any question, let me just tell you on a much more anecdotal but also much more important level, this is something I know because if the war on drugs were really about drugs, I'm not sure who would be giving this lecture to you tonight, but it would not be me. Why? Because they do not let you Skype in a lecture from prison, and that is where I would be if the war on drugs were actually about illegal narcotics. And I can admit this to you now because the statute of limitations has expired. And because I'm not holding anymore because my asthma came back, so I'm out. You know, I'm done. <laughs> so, the war on drugs is not about drugs. If it was, I'd be doing 20 or more years in prison. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm not saying, like, drugs are cool. Don't do drugs. Don't do drugs. <laughs> I'm just reminiscing. That's all. Um, my point here is this. Right? We have a perception in this country. Law enforcement has it. I know. I've talked to plenty of cops and asked them the question. What's the first thing you think when you see a young black male driving a nice car in your community? And unflinchingly, they will say, almost everyone, including the black cops, so it's not just white cops, including the African-American officers, they will often, if not always, say that they assume that person to be a drug dealer. Because how could that young black person have a nice car if they weren't a drug dealer? I ask them then, what do you think when you see a young white male, same age, driving the same kind of nice car in your community? They will unfailingly, unflinchingly, and without exception, usually at least, say, spoiled little rich kid, daddy bought him a car. Fascinating, right? Same age, same kind of car, same neighborhood, but only the epidermal camouflage that these kids are carrying around with them, that is, say, the color of their skin, apparently tips off law enforcement that it must be this for this kid and that for that kid. Now, they might not like the rich, spoiled kid either, you know, because most cops are working class folks. They, they, you know, they got no love lost for the rich. I mean, that's not, you know, they're not getting paid well, that's for sure. 
But guess what they're not going to do? Profile the rich kid. Guess what they're not going to do? Pull the rich kid over and search his trunk. Why? Because daddy has juice and he knows that if he does that, that he'll be in trouble, right? Because the parents have got enough power and money, so then they just shake down the black kid who they think is the drug dealer. Here's a dirty little secret. Black folks are not more likely to possess drugs. They are not more likely to use drugs. They are not even more likely to deal drugs. Those are all racist lies told by people that don't actually feel the need to do homework before they talk. Right? The actual rates of drug use are virtually identical between black folks, Latino folk, and white folk. The rates of possession, identical between black folk, Latino folk, white folk. The rates of dealing, virtually identical between black folk, white folk, and Latino folk. And especially among younger folk, they're usually higher for whites than they are for people of color. But who's being stopped? Who's being arrested? Who's being prosecuted? Who's being incarcerated? Well, we know that African Americans are four times more likely to be arrested for weed than white folks are. Not because they smoke weed four times more often. I just told you the rates at which people are using the drug are identical. But black folks four times more likely to be arrested. Five to nine times more likely to be incarcerated for a drug offense, depending on which state you're in. Now, I want to try to break this down into human terms, because I know when you throw out ratios like that, five to one, four to one, you know, a little abstract. So let's break it down and think about the human cost here, right? So about six months ago, I wanted to figure out, just for my own edification and then, you know, for use in lectures like this, um, about how many black folks is that who are being arrested every year, above and beyond the numbers that would be if their arrest rates mirrored their drug possession rates, right? Because at least in theory, if the war on drugs wasn't being prosecuted in a racist way, you would expect that the drug arrest would roughly mirror the rates at which folks break the law, right? So if 14% of the users are black, you would expect 14% of the arrest for use roughly would be black. And if white folks are 64% of the users, those who are breaking drug laws, you'd expect about 64%, give or take, to be arrested yeah. of the percentage of those who are arrested. So it's really easy to figure out the excess black arrest and the under-arresting of white folks by just taking the FBI numbers, comparing them to the usage rate numbers that are provided by the CDC or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, doing a little math, and then you come up with the excess arrest rate and the under-arrest rate. When I did this, I found out that every single year in this country, approximately 160,000 black people are arrested for drug possession who would not be arrested if, in fact, the war on drugs was being fought in an equitable fashion, which I know is sort of a silly argument that we should fight a war on drugs at all. You don't treat a public health problem like a criminal problem, but putting that aside, different lecture for a different night. <laughs> 160,000 more black folks now every year getting an arrest record for drugs, right? Just because they're the ones that get focused on. And the data says that there are 160,000 fewer white people getting arrested than would be if the war on drugs actually mirrored the actual rates at which white folks and black folks actually use and possess drugs. So what does that mean? Think about that again in human terms. 160,000 a year over here who have a record who wouldn't, 160,000 over here who are walking around free as a bird, no record, who would have a record if this thing were being fought equitably. Now, stretch that over 10 years, what do you get? Now, in the last decade, that means we've got 1.6 million. Now, let's just round down. One and a half million black folks in the last 10 years who have an arrest record today for drugs who would not have one but for the racist way in which the war on drugs has been prosecuted and 1.5 million white folks who don't have a record who would have a record if that war on drugs had not been fought in a racist fashion. Now tell me, what does that mean for who's able to get a job and who's not? Because you get a record, now you're going to play hell finding work, right? Even if you didn't get convicted, even if they didn't prosecute you. I don't know about the state of Maryland, but I'm from Tennessee, and in Tennessee, I just found, I found this out last week, didn't even know this, that if you have an arrest record and the DA doesn't even take you to trial, that stays on your record unless you go downtown and fill out a bunch of paperwork to get it expunged. So you've got one and a half million black folks around this country with records who wouldn't have one. Now that's one and a half million folks roughly going to have a harder time finding work, and you've got one and a half million white folks don't have a record, but they would if the system weren't racist, and that means they can get a job. Who does that advantage? Who does that disadvantage? What does it mean for able to go to college? Because you can't get a student loan when you got a record, right? I'm not going to give you government-backed loans if you have an arrest record, certainly not if you have a conviction record. So what does that mean? 1.5 million black folk over a 10-year period unable to access higher ed in the same way 1.5 million white folk who can. 
What does it mean for receiving public benefits? Because they will cut you off various forms of public assistance and make it impossible for you or even your family to receive those benefits if you have an arrest record for something like narcotics. What does it mean for the ability to vote? See, not only when you're locked up, but when you're on probation and parole in most states, you're not allowed to vote. And in some states, you're barred from voting for life if you have a felony conviction for something like drugs. There are literally a couple of million black folks in this country who can't vote right now, even though they've done their time, they've paid their debt to society, but because they have been disenfranchised by laws that were passed in the late 1800s and early 1900s specifically to deny black folks the right to vote, even though they had been promised that theoretically by the Constitution in the wake of Reconstruction, the wake of the Civil War, we now mean that we got one and a half million more folks with a prospect of not voting, not going to school, not getting a job. See, this thing has real consequence. So if the folks who enforce this war on drugs in an inequitable way happen to have a badge and a gun and a uniform, how in the world can we be shocked that folks who are exposed to that, who are exposed to racial profiling, stop and frisk in New York City might be a bit cynical about the folks enforcing the law. I think they need to be forgiven for that cynicism because I think they've come by it honestly, you see. But it's not just law enforcement, it's immigration. The only reason that folks can talk about building walls or, you know, it's not even that, now people are just like falling over themselves to come up with the craziest idea to get rid of undocumented peoples, right? So Donald Trump's gonna build a wall and round people up on cattle cars and deport them, right? Which is funny, coming from somebody that's on the right and says he doesn't like big government, that's like sort of a big government program, I would think. <laughs> I doubt that like a private company is gonna pick up the tab for that, you know, right? But, so he's saying that then Chris Christie, not to be outdone, right, says, well, I don't know about a wall, but we can track them like, F, like FedEx packages. <laughs> the hell? Track them like <laughs> FedEx packages? What's he gonna do, stand at the border and then folks come across, you're like, wait, excuse me. I need to give you a UPC code right here on your arm so we can track you. What? Right? I'm waiting, literally expecting within the next few weeks that one of these candidates is going to propose building a dome over the country just in case undocumented folks decide to parachute in. <laughs> and then Carly Fiorina is going to release the Kraken on the shores of the Atlantic. <laughs> right? Sea monsters to gobble up anyone swimming into the country. Right? I mean, it's insanity, but the only reason that folks are falling prey to this, and many are now, we can laugh about it, but there are a lot of folks out there think this is real, think this makes sense. Because you know why? Because they want their country back. <laughs> Remember that from the Tea Party days a few years back when they were relevant? Remember that? When Glenn Beck still had a job, like a real job? Remember that? <laughs> I want my country back. Funny. Interesting how some folks think that this country belonged to them. That mentality of possession, that mentality of entitlement. See, we like to use the word entitlement to refer to poor folk who think they might be entitled to do things like eat or not sleep in the street. Apparently, we're more concerned about people who feel entitled not to die than we are people who feel entitled to a whole continental shelf to call their own. Right? So when you say, I want my country back, what you just told people is, this is my country. But what James Baldwin also told us 50 or so years ago that we did not want to hear is that the United States was never a white country. It's just that European people thought it was and lived as if it were. Right? So if you believe it's yours, then all of a sudden anything that looks different starts to threaten it, whether it's different color, different ethnicity, different culture, different religion. Right? Thus, all the paranoia about Sharia law coming to Texas. Ugh. The hell? Or folks that are threatened by same-sex marriage, by marriage equality. Oh, yes, heterosexuals quaking in their boots at the prospects of marriage equality. It threatens my marriage. If your marriage is so weak... <laughs> If your marriage is so weak that the simple prospects of marriage equality would lead you to go, hmm, I have options now, maybe, <laughs> then you might not have gotten married. Might have been better off. Like if you sit across from your partner, your spouse, your opposite sex spouse at the breakfast table and you're like, you know, the only reason I can even stand to look you in your face is because the gays can't marry, then you probably should never have gotten married. But it's not really, is it, that straight folks feel threatened in terms of their marriage. What they feel threatened by, apparently at least some, 
is that our marriages won't have this sanctified, special, privileged location. We know that our marriages aren't threatened by marriage equality, but the specialness of our marriages is. The superiority, the presumed moral betterness of our marriages. That's what's threatened, because we don't just want marriage equality. We want our relationships to be given the imprimatur of law and superiority. That is a mentality of entitlement. right? It's somebody who's saying, in effect, if everybody can join the club, what's the point of having a club? Right? That's the same thing with immigration. If anybody can come in, then what's the point of having a country? I don't know. First of all, the folks that are coming in, let's be clear, uh, history, they're sort of coming home, okay? Um, I mean, just to be really specific, in most cases, their ancestors were on that plot of land that we now call the American Southwest. They're coming home, and we're all like, nope, we changed the locks. <laughs> If I come to your house, take all your stuff, put it in the street, and then you're like, can I come back? And we're like, no, you would think that that was horribly unjust. And in this case, we actually have a treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which extends to the descendants of those whose land was jacked, certain rights that we as a country have never decided to actually provide. So we're in violation of treaties that we sign, not only vis-a-vis -vis indigenous people, but in this case, the descendants of Mexican folk. That's just an interesting little side note, but it's not the most important point about the immigration debate. The biggest point is the reason that people are so hostile is because we can't see them in us and us in them. And the reason we can't is because we've been telling a lie to ourselves about our own migration patterns. Going back to what Baldwin said, if you think history flatters you, as you do indeed since you wrote it, you're impaled like a butterfly on a pen. You can't see yourself or change yourself or the world. So what's the lie that we've told about immigration? Here's what it sounds like. Well, my family came the right way, legally. <laughs> and I don't mind if they come, as long as they do it the right way, like my family, legally. Really? Okay. Let us parse this for just a second. If your great-grandfather came to the country legally, when there was no law in place to break, <laughs> That is not something for which your great-grandfather is in extended kudos. <laughs> you don't get a cookie, or a trophy, or a badge, or a pat on the back, or a merit ribbon for not breaking a law that didn't even exist. And ever since 1790, those of us of European descent have been able to come to the United States with very few restrictions and become citizens immediately. The very first law passed by the Congress after the ratification of the Constitution before they did anything else was the Naturalization Act of 1790. And it said that all free white persons and only free white persons could become citizens. So, see, white lives already mattered. White migration was ensconced in law. There was no legal or illegal, documented or undocumented. We saved that for other people. So when folks say that their family came legally, they're just, it's, a, it's a complete non-starter discussion. It means nothing whatsoever. The other lie we tell is this. Well, our families came for freedom. They're just coming for stuff. They're coming for stuff, like our jobs. Okay, first of all, do you have the job yet? Because if you ain't got the job yet, it's not your job. That's how that works. Right? It's only your job if you're like already on the payroll. That's just how that works. Like, right? I got an email the other day from a guy. He was like, I right, white guy. He's like, I can't get a job because of affirmative action. All the good jobs are going to black people and Mexicans. Where in the hell are these jobs that black people and Mexicans are taking? Is this like, are these jobs in Second Life? Where are these jobs? Are they on Minecraft? Where are these jobs? Where, where are these jobs that people of color are snatching from the hands of white folks? Because the data actually says people of color are twice as likely as white folks to be unemployed, even when they have the same level of education and experience. So obviously, whatever jobs they're taking, they are not taking them far, right? <laughs> but back to the point about immigration. So we say, we came for free. See, this is like jazz. It's not linear, so y'all just like, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to go over here, and I'll come back to here in a minute. So, totally don't even know where I am. That's, that's jazz. I'm just like, I'm lost, but I'm going to make it make sense here in just a minute. Um, oh yes, we came for freedom. They're coming for stuff. Let us be clear, we didn't come for freedom. Because if we'd been coming for freedom, we would have established freedom. But we didn't. Not only did we enslave the bodies of others to make the continent and the elites of that continent wealthy, not only did we 
exterminate if necessary, and certainly push outward to the boundaries of the country, indigenous people, not only did we steal half of Mexico in a war of aggression, none of which has a lot to do with freedom, we killed each other, right? In the colonies, white folks burning people at the stake for being witches, hanging them, drowning them, right? White folks have been spending the better part of human history in Europe, like, killing each other, right? So the whole idea is not, not even just what we did to other people, we just, Irish and Anglos and, you know, everybody killing everybody else. So we didn't come for freedom, we came for stuff. We came for stuff. We didn't come on the basis of principle any more than folks coming from Central and South America and from Mexico are right now. They're coming for stuff just like we came for stuff. Opportunity, the ability to feed one's family, the ability to actually make a life for oneself. How do we know that's why we came? It's very simple. Because the folks who came were the losers of their respective societies. I don't mean that negatively. I'm not using the word loser like as a pejorative. I'm using it as a descriptor. They were the losers, right? The losers who couldn't make it, who couldn't feed their families, many of them were convicts, they were starving again, as James Baldwin said, and they couldn't make it in the old country. Right? The other thing Baldwin told us is the big problem with white America is that white folks still think that our ancestors wanted to come here. But they didn't. They would have preferred to stay. Nobody likes to pack up and move across an ocean. And if you're winning, you certainly didn't do it, right? Sometimes it's always funny to me when some white folks are like, my family came over on the Mayflower. Okay, shh. You might not want to brag about that <laughs> if you actually knew who was on the Mayflower. I'm not sure who was on the Mayflower, but now I know who wasn't. The king. The king was not on the Mayflower. Nobody that the king liked or even knew and thought well of was on the Mayflower. The Mayflower was filled with those who were losing in the old country because the winners did not get on the boat. Why would you leave if things were going well? Can you even envision this? Somebody in England saying, well, you know, uh, Seems to me we're doing pretty well over here, but uh, I think it would be an adventure <laughs> if we got on the boat, a rickety old ship in the 17th century, full of holes, taking on water. We might drown, we might be eaten by sharks, but it'll be fun. <laughs> no, no, no. If you were winning, if you were doing well, if you were not desperate, you did not leave. That is the same with those who come today and whom we denigrate, right? And so our inability to see ourselves in them and to see they in we is what is keeping us from being able to talk about these issues in a forthright and honest manner. But we have to do better. We have to understand history in order to understand the present because it's very dangerous, isn't it, to go down this road. It's very dangerous to go down the road of more authoritarian, totalitarian, even fascist ideas about how we're going to seal off borders and deport people and round them up and kick them out of the country, right? Talking about how we're just going to use tanks in our urban neighborhoods to police the streets and have our law enforcement in places like Ferguson rocking camo when they're in the street. I want you to think about that for a minute. Right? It seems innocuous, but why are urban police forces being given military equipment and Camouflage. Camouflage, right? Camo, think about this. We have two types of camouflage, basically, military, right? One is the old school camouflage from the Southeast Asian Wars, so that's green and it's supposed to fit in with the jungle, right? And the other is the more modern, you know, Desert Storm and since then the war in Afghanistan and Iraq camo that's like supposed to be sand colored, right? So it hides you in the desert. Um, okay, if you're a cop in Ferguson, <laughs> <laughs> or Baltimore? <laughs> like, what good is camouflage that will keep you hidden in the desert, right? If you had camouflage that looked like the check cashing outlet that's on the corner, that might actually make sense because that's what they open in those neighborhoods as opposed to bank branches, right, and other ways of actually procuring money. But it doesn't look like the pawn shop. It doesn't look like the check cashing outlet. It doesn't look like anything in the urban landscape. It looks like stuff that isn't going to hide you. So if it's not going to hide you, why are they wearing it? There is only one possible explanation because it is a mentality of war. It is people who were saying, we are at war with our own people. And since Fallujah is done, we'll just fight that war here. Now we better think about that and what that means, right? Because that ends up creating more tension, more stress. It makes it more dangerous to be a cop on the street. See, I actually think that we need to protect the lives of cops and the lives of those that police actually police, but we're never gonna do that if we can't have an honest discussion about what it means to feel like an occupied people, right? 
They'll never be safe. Police officers will never be safe as long as their task is to wage war and be perceived as waging war against the people. It's the culture of policing that's the problem, not individual officers. Right? It's the culture that's saying that this is a mentality of control. There's a Baltimore cop that has since been sort of you know, left the force. He was either pushed out or quit. Young guy, looks about 12, but he's not. He's a, he's a vet. He was, he was in Iraq or Afghanistan one, and now you can see him on YouTube. He's been doing a lot of interviews and talking about the problem, and I can't remember his name, but he's fantastic. And he's talking about how when he was an officer in Baltimore, how you know the problem, he knew lots of great cops. He considers himself a great cop, but the problem was that he was constantly being told that his commendations, his promotion, his salary, his career was predicated not on whether crime went down. That wasn't considered important. Not on whether he was able to resolve conflicts in the street peacefully, without violence. That didn't count for anything. The only thing that mattered were his arrest numbers. Right? And so we talked about how if he didn't have enough people arrested, they would basically send him out to make more arrests. And he would find himself going in to urban areas and shaking down folks for dime bags just so he could get his numbers up so that his career could be promoted. Right? That's not about him being a bad cop or every cop in the Baltimore PD being a bad cop. It's about a culture that's predicated on control and not actually peace. Right? Not predicated on crime being reduced, but on people being arrested. Which is to say crime numbers are better for the law enforcement community when they're higher. Right? Which means, if anything, there is a, no real incentive to bring down the crime rates if that's how you're getting paid. And if there is a brutality complaint and then the family sues, it doesn't come out of police budgets, it comes out of the general revenue, so there's no incentive to police brutality either because you're not gonna have it come out of your own budget. The only way that we're gonna have communities and police be safe is if communities get to decide who polices their streets. And that means we've gotta have something like this. We've gotta have 60 to 90 days when you become an officer, a probationary period where you spend that first two to three months without a gun, without a badge, and the power to arrest, but you walk the streets of the neighborhoods that you're gonna be policing and you get to know the people who live there. You talk to them on their front porch, you talk to them in the barber shops, in the coffee shops, in the churches, in the schools, in their living rooms. You go door to door and you meet people and you ask them, what do you need from us and what do you not need from us? And after two to three months of getting to know people, then they get to vote on whether you become an officer. And if you do it well and you show yourself to be humble and committed to serving the people of that community, they will ratify you in a heartbeat and then they will be safe and so will you as an officer because when they see you on the street, they will know you and they will not fear you and they will not hate you. They will know that you are there for the community. It would be better for everybody involved. But we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. And so we end up going down these dangerous paths that only make the tensions worse, that only make the risk both to folks in those communities and the officers greater. Plans that aren't really gonna solve a so-called border crisis are only gonna make that worse. I mean, especially when you consider that one of the reasons folks flee Mexico in the first place to come here is because this country pushed through trade agreements that have immiserated agricultural workers in that country. When NAFTA was passed in 1994, what happened? We were able to flood their market with agricultural goods from the United States, undermine the cost that their farmers can get for their own produce. So if I'm an ag laborer on a farm in Mexico, now I can't make a living because we've flooded the market with our economy of scale, dumping all of these ag products into Mexico. So I have to leave the farm, go to the cities in search of work. I go to a place like Mexico City, there's a labor glut. I can't find work and I keep moving north. So for the United States, after pushing that law through, which has also reduced manufacturing employment in the United States, it's been a bad deal for workers on both sides of the border, but once you push that through to then say you're gonna build a wall and keep people out as they try to flee the results of an economic policy that was passed on behalf of your own country's elites, that's like setting fire to the house and then blocking the exits so nobody can escape. So instead of solving that problem, we scapegoat brown people. And we say they're the reason the economy's bad. They're the reason I can't find a job. But those folks on Wall Street wiped out far more jobs in 18 months than all the black and brown folks in the history of this country could have possibly stolen from anybody. In 18 months, from 07 to early 09, these rich, white, supposedly very intelligent men on Wall Street who call themselves investment bankers and probably all had very high SAT scores wiped out $12.5 trillion worth of value, 20% of the accumulated net worth of this country that it took over 230 years to build up, they wiped it out in 18 months. And yet we're not profiling them. We don't stop rich white dudes driving their Lexuses or Lexi, whatever the proper plural form is. 
We don't say pop your trunk. I want to look for financial documents that prove that you're engaged in illegality, even though these are folks that did far more damage to the world economy than all the black and brown street hoods put together. You know how long it would take for black and brown street criminals to steal twelve and a half trillion dollars? Like it would take five thousand years, right? And they'd have to steal like around the clock, twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week, never taking a break to pee, sleep, eat, nothing. You'd just be hand in the pocket. Hand in the pocket, stealing from you, and like 3,000 years in, you'd be like, y'all have 12 and a half trillion yet? And they'd be like, no, not even close. Check back in 2,000 more years, right? <laughs> but these rich white dudes did that in 18 months, and people get very upset when I say that they were white. It's like, oh, that's racist. No, it's descriptive. And if they had been black, everybody would have noticed. If some black folks rip off the world economy to the tune of 12 and a half trillion dollars, if black folks or Latino folk or Asian folk or indigenous folk, people of color generally, wipe out $12.5 trillion of mostly white people's money, you know full well what the dialogue is going to be. How did these black people get these banking jobs? <laughs> oh, I bet it was affirmative action, giving them jobs they weren't qualified for. But when white folks do it, nobody's thinking about that. How they get the jobs? Oh, merit. Okay, clearly not. Right? <laughs> Bankers who were meritorious don't lose or steal $12.5 trillion of other people's money. But I haven't heard anyone going up to white people in business school and being like, okay, no more banking gigs for you. You're done. You're out. No more. You can't work in banks. People of color, on the other hand, had done that. I'm pretty sure the dialogue would have been different. But this is how the country goes. We blame brown folks. We blame the people on the bottom right, for bleeding the country dry when it's the folks at the top who were doing that. We blame workers for not making enough money to get off food stamps, right? Even though we don't want to make an issue out of the companies that don't pay them enough to allow them to get off food stamps. Right now, the biggest employer in this country is Walmart. They pay the vast majority of their employees not enough to get out of poverty, so the majority of people who work at Walmart end up having to be on SNAP. That's what we now call food stamp benefits. Every Thanksgiving, Walmart sets up bins at their stores encouraging employees to donate food to other employees so that the people who work there will have food for Thanksgiving. Rather than pay them a living wage, they pay them too little, then they have a food drive. And then these folks have to go on food stamps, and guess who the biggest redeemer of food stamps in the United States is? Walmart. So I don't pay you enough, now you've got to get on food stamps, and where are you going to spend the food stamps and buy the food? At my store. Walmart makes $13.5 billion extra dollars a year redeeming food stamps that wouldn't even need to be given out to people if the folks that work there didn't actually get paid sub-poverty wages. And all of this happens while the Walmart Corporation is incredibly wealthy and the six heirs to the Walton fortune. Five of whom were born into the family, one of whom Christy Walton married into the family, are worth so much money that they actually, just the six of them, have the same net worth as the bottom 40% of the American population. 137 million people on this end, six people on this end. The Walton family, which is rich in part because they paid their employees so little, they make $7,500 profit off of every employee they have. Multiply that out by all the employees they have. You understand how they make this money. They have so much money they can buy every house, every townhome, every condo in the city of Seattle or the city of Dallas or the city of Miami. Just those six people. They can buy every single house, every single owned occupancy residence in any of those cities and still have $40 billion left. With which they can buy all the houses in Napa if they like wine or all the houses in Anaheim if their kids love Disney. Right? And they would still have money left. Just to put in perspective how much money that is, uh, everybody seems to think Oprah is real rich. rich. Well, I was talking about Oprah Winfrey. She's rich. Ugh. Oprah only has enough money to buy all the houses in Mokina, Illinois, wherever that is. <laughs> Not quite Dallas, Seattle, Miami, Napa, Anaheim, Mokina, right? So that ain't money. <laughs> Oprah money is not Walton. In fact, the Walton, just those six, have enough money that it's more than all the money of the following people put together. Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, Donald Trump, right? um, Howard Schultz, the founder and the CEO of Starbucks, uh, Phil, uh, uh, Nike, the guy that is the owner of Nike, the founder of Nike. And even if you take Bill Gates' money, He's the richest man in the world. You put all of these, like the top 10 or 11 names that you would recognize as really wealthy, they still are about $15 billion short of the Walton money. So who's really the problem? I mean, is the problem really folks at the bottom or is it people at the top? 
It's not just that, it's the way that employers treat employees. We blame employees. Like if you're working at a company and you steal $100 out of the till one night, like let's say you're working at a restaurant and you take 100 bucks, you're going to jail. They'll catch you, they'll arrest you, you're probably gonna go to jail. On the other hand, if your employer steals from you via this thing called wage theft, whereby they don't pay you for work that you did, like if you're a prep cook or if you're um, bussing tables and you're doing prep work before the restaurant opens, a lot of times employers will just screw you. They won't, they won't pay for that even though the law says they're supposed to. Or they'll pay certain people less than minimum wage even when they should, or they, will pay them, they won't pay them overtime even when they're entitled to it, or they'll pay them less than the union wage on a union uh, negotiated job. Wage theft every single year costs this country three times more than all the street theft combined. All the bank robberies, all the liquor store robberies, all the home invasion robberies, all the street theft in America, one third the size of wage theft. But if I'm the employer and I steal from you, you can't call the police and have me arrested. Because that's not dealt with in the criminal system, it's dealt with in the civil system. So now you've got to get an attorney and sue me in civil court. Which if you're desperate and don't have any money and don't think you're probably going to win that lawsuit, probably is not what you're going to do. So what's the point here? Once again, it's folks at the top. It's the culture of affluence, of predatory affluence that is the problem. Not the culture of poverty, not the culture of black and brown folks, not the culture of new immigrants. So we're taking our eye off the ball when we allow our politicians to scapegoat people at the bottom for problems that are really caused at the top. And if we don't get that clear, we're in big trouble because the last economic meltdown that we had just a few years ago, from which we're only now beginning to emerge, was predicated on this affluence culture and its actions. It wasn't brought to its knees by the poor. The poor don't have the power to destroy the economy. What happened was you had a bunch of bankers giving out useless mortgage loans, bundling them into big packages and selling them to large wealthy investors, knowing that many of those loans wouldn't be good, knowing that folks weren't going to be able to pay their notes when the interest rates went up, doing predatory loans. But here's the thing. These subprime loans that helped bring down the housing market and with it the larger economy didn't just start in 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007. This stuff started in the 90s. But see, it started in black neighborhoods and it started in Latino neighborhoods and nobody seemed to notice or care. I mean, some people noticed. The Congressional Black Caucus tried to get traction on this. Community organizers tried to get traction on this. And state after state and at the congressional level, nobody wanted to impose any new regulations on bankers because the free market, bleh, right? The free market, capitalism will solve this problem. Yes, that's clearly evident now. So we don't want to regulate what banks do. Oh, goodness, no. We don't want to regulate these inflated interest rates. No, in fact, we want to deregulate the mortgage industry. We want to deregulate financial services. Democrats and Republicans did that, by the way. Bill Clinton is the one that pushed that through, just so we're clear. Right? So this was a bipartisan shame. Deregulating financial services, so now you can mix investment banks and depository banks and getting rid of all the rules that have been in place, many of them for decades, for a couple of generations, making it easier to turn the economy into one big casino for wealthy people. So we didn't stop it when they started it in black neighborhoods and brown neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods. So what happens is seven or eight years later, when they bled dry those neighborhoods, there's no more money to be made from giving subprime predatory loans in the hood. Because right? they already went in there and they sucked all the money out of there, so now they want more money because that's the nature of the beast. So they say, well, now we're going to go into the suburbs and the small towns, the rural hamlets, the exurbs, and we're going to start giving the same loans to middle class folks. Right? So you give loans to middle class folks who were often white to get these loans that were also going to blow up in their faces because that's where the money was. See, but if we had cared about it when it was just hurting those folks, we might have stopped it before the problem spread, but the problem metastasized like a cancer in the economy because we weren't paying attention. We weren't thinking about the consequences. This is why this thing we're calling racial justice, racial equity has to matter to everybody, right? Because if we don't take care of business when the pain is localized, I promise you, all of our history tells us that that pain will spread and that pretty soon it'll be felt by the vast majority of us. So this is not charity work, right? Being white, standing up for Racial justice is not about saving black people. It's not about saving Latino folk, Asian folk, indigenous folk, all of whom are struggling with unemployment rates higher, you know, not just African Americans, Latinos with a degree, 70% more likely to be out of work than white folks with a degree, Asian Americans with a degree, 30% more likely than white folks with a degree to be unemployed, our native brothers and sisters two thirds more likely even with a college degree. So. This is a problem all throughout the economy, and it's not about saving them. If white folks get involved in the anti-racism struggle to save people of color, we need to find a new hobby. Right? That's not our job. Our job is to liberate ourselves. 
from this thing called white supremacy, to talk about what James Baldwin talked about and talk about how we're going to get off this pin that we've impaled ourselves on by beating ourselves lies about our past that lead us to misunderstand our present and have no idea about our future. But I insist that we're better than this. As a country, I believe we're better than this. As people called white, I believe we're better than this. See, I think most people are good people. Sometimes, you know, folks get the wrong impression. They think, I hate white people. Let me be clear. I love me some white people. <laughs> I really do. My wife, white. Love her. <laughs> Our two girls, white. That's what happens when white people make babies. <laughs> love them. Right? My mom, nice white lady. Love her. Right? My dad, don't get along with him, but it's not the white thing. It's about some other stuff that <laughs> we don't really have time to process here tonight. Right? But, so it's not about white people. See, none of this is about white people as people. This is about whiteness as a system. It's about whiteness as an organizing principle for national identity. It's about white supremacy at a systemic and institutional level. And I'm saying to you that white supremacy has played a trick on everybody. White supremacy's biggest trick was convincing people of European descent that we were white, right? Because our, our people didn't know what that meant. When my great-grandparents came here, or my great-great whatever it was, or in some cases back in the 60s, they didn't know what white meant. They weren't white till they got here, right? They were whatever they were. Whiteness was the thing that the elite did to trick working class and poor European peasants into believing they were on the same team as rich people. That's a hell of a trick, isn't it? When you can take poor folks that don't have a pot to piss in, proverbially speaking, and don't have really even the ownership of the shirt on their back, and you convince them that they're just like the planter elite. When you in the South can say to poor folks who don't own other human beings, they don't even own their rights and their own labor hardly. They don't have property, but you can tell these poor quote unquote white people, hey, you gotta go fight for my property. Who would do that? I got a nice house, but I'm telling you, if somebody were to invade my block, and try to take it, I don't think I could convince Nario, one of y'all, to come and defend it for me, right? Like, can you please come? I know you don't know me real well, and I know it's not your house, but it's nice. Can you defend it? And you'd be like, sure. That's pretty much what the Confederate soldier did. Because if you owned enough slaves, you didn't have to serve. You could get out of service. You just get these poor yokels to do it for you. But they marched off to war, and hundreds of thousands of them died for a lie. And we don't like to say that because that offends great-great-grandpappy Beauregard. I don't care. <laughs> great-great-grandpappy Beauregard was a sucker. Great-great-grandpappy Beauregard got took, right? Got hoodwinked, right? Got taken for granted and used by rich folks. That's been the whole history. Same thing happens when labor unions wouldn't let black and, black, black, black and Mexican folk and Chinese labor in. And then... You know, white working people, you would think that doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't I want the union to be integrated? Because if it's integrated, two things happen. Number one, it's a bigger, stronger union, so we can fight for better wages, fight for better working conditions. And secondly, if the black and brown folks are standing side by side with me on the picket line, the boss can't use them to break the strike. How hard is this to understand? See, it shouldn't be. But you had labor union leaders that were like, no, we would rather be the slaves of capital permanently than to take black folks into our lodges as brothers, right? Think about that, how whiteness has tricked people of European descent into ignoring their actual interests of solidarity with the black and brown. The same is true with immigration, because the truth is, as long as we have an economic system that allows rich folks to sell products all around the world and allows rich folks to move their money all around the world, if you chain labor to its country of origin and don't let labor move where it can get the highest wage, then you've just tilted the game inevitably in favor of capital and against working people. That's basic economics, right? If labor can't move but capital can, who wins? If labor can't move but products and goods can, who wins? Not working people, whether south of the border or north of that border. So this is a fool's errand, this thing called white supremacy. It's not helping anyone except the very, very, very top elite. And I don't think any of y'all are in that group. And if you are, don't let me know about it. <laughs> don't even tell me, right? But I don't think most of us are. I know most of us aren't. I believe we're capable of a different country. I believe we're capable of a different place where people of color aren't twice as likely to be out of work, three times as likely to be poor, nine years less life expectancy, 1 20th the net worth, double the rate of infant mortality, double the rate of low birth weight kids. I think we're capable of more than that. And I always find it fascinating how when those of us on the left criticize the country and the conditions of the country, 
and we criticize the economic system and the political system and policing and all of those things, how we're the ones who get labeled as, oh, you hate America, oh, you're anti-American, but who really hates the country and the culture and the people? Would it be those of us who believe that we're capable of better, who believe that we should be inspiring one another to live up to our aspirations, or would it be the people who were cynical enough to look at the current condition and basically say, yeah, it's about the best we can do? Which is more hateful, the cynicism of resignation to the reality of the status quo or the promise and the potential of moving forward and getting something better? See, I think I know which one is more hateful, and it's not what I'm saying. And it's not what those of us who believe in democracy and who believe in freedom and who believe in justice are saying. We are not the problem. We have never been the problem in this country. We have never been the ones who have hampered the country and kept it from moving forward. It has always been those who would build the wall. It is all meta metaphorically or literally speaking. It has always been those who would define the boundaries of Americanism in this very narrow way so as to exclude those that they don't feel like including. It is always and forever been that politic that keeps us coming back to this moment. And if you're tired of having to have these conversations the way that I guarantee most people of color in this country are, and some of us white folks too, then there's only one way going back to Baldwin to be released from it so that we no longer suffer enormously from the resulting personal incoherence of our politics. The only way that we can be freed of it is to be honest, is to look it in the face, is to look it in our face, and to commit to a very different future for our children and grandchildren's generation. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate it.